Let me uh, give you an example of the uh, violation of the law of, of rationality. Uh, when Nancy and I lived in, in Austin, Texas, uh, that's where our oldest son was born, her uh, obstetrician uh, went to school at the University of Texas, graduated from there, went up to the University of Arkansas, got his medical degree, then came back down, of course, to Austin and practiced. <clears throat> Yet he was an avid uh, uh, fan of University of Arkansas. He had it all emblazoned all over his office. Now you have Jess Whitlock, who uh, makes his living in Texas and has for some years in a number of different locations in Texas. And yet he's an avid fan of the University of Oklahoma. Amen. So that's just a demonstration of the uh, Irrationality that some people. I think it was Kay uh, Francis that uh, uh, told me that, you know, why is, you know, Oklahoma is okay? Why is that? Because they don't know how to spell mediocre. <laughs> but Jesse's presentation of the gospel is anything but mediocre. I think he demonstrated that in his uh, previous lesson, how he plainly sets forth, forth the uh, premise and the, uh, me, the way in which these various denominations violate the scriptures. And I fully expect him to do that today. He's going to be talking about a subject that probably you all have heard about but may not know a lot about this Christian science. So Jess, come talk to us. <coughs> M-E-D-I-O-C-R-E. -E. And Oklahoma is okay. I do appreciate again the opportunity to stand before this assembly. I appreciate so very much the invitation from the elders of this congregation and from Brother David Brown. It is always an humbling experience, I guess partly because of our introductions, and also an honor. I appreciate so much those kind words. I appreciate uh, Jack and Brenda and the fine hospitality of their home. It's uh, been a very enjoyable time and appreciate them so much. Appreciate so much every member of this congregation. Having directed a few lectureships in, in South Texas, I know that it's not the director or the elders alone, or even the speakers that makes that lectureship successful. It takes every member of that congregation doing their fair share. And we see this year after year when we come to spring. Brenda and I have talked the last couple mornings about <clears throat> this habit she has of a cup of coffee every morning. And it reminded me, since I'm part Cherokee, about the old Cherokee chief who went to the cafe early one morning. He walked in the door carrying a big old shotgun in one hand, dragging a huge buffalo in the other hand. He went up to the counter and said, me want coffee. And the owner of the cafe said, sure thing. Poured him a big old cup of coffee, steaming hot coffee. The old chief drank the coffee down in one gulp. Then he took that big old shotgun and he turned it toward that buffalo and I mean just shot him right between the eyes. Blood and guts went everywhere. All over the floor, all over the walls, all over the ceiling. And he walked out the door. The next morning the same Cherokee chief came back carrying that same big old shotgun hauling another big old buffalo in the other hand. He went up to the counter and said, me want coffee. The cafe owner said, now hold on there, Tonto. You were here yesterday and we're still trying to clean up the mess from yesterday. What, what was that all about? He said, uh, 
me training to become U.S. congressman. I come in and I drink coffee, shoot the bull, leave the mess for somebody else to clean up. <laughs> Whenever I study about the four denominations that were assigned to me that we dealt with yesterday and then this one, the doctrine of the Church of Christ Scientist, sometimes known as the theology simply of Christian science, it just amazes me how people can be deceived and so easily fooled by this kind of nonsense. You will recall from yesterday's lecture that I have nicknamed this particular church the Almost Church because Mary Baker Eddy had an obsession with sickness and disease as a child and she became very interested in healing. Unfortunately, she was uh, easily persuaded by fake healers. Some people call them faith healers, I call them fake healers. But we're going to notice in this particular lesson that neither true science nor the word Christian has anything to do with this particular cult. Mr. Mead in his book explains, and I quote, this volume, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures and the Bible have become the twofold textbook of Christian science. That's on page 104 of his work. The Church of Christ Scientists were established at Boston, Massachusetts in the year of 1879. Numerous histories indicate that the uh, church there in Boston is counted as what they term the mother church. When I went to the old Preston Road School of Preaching, Brother Eldred Stevens stepped into the classroom one day. He had to substitute for one of my professors and he actually came into the classroom to teach the first lesson I'd ever heard about this group called the Christian Scientist. I had heard the name, I knew that such a church existed, but I really did not know a whole lot about it. And I'll never forget the way in which he introduced that particular course of study to us. And it really surprised me the way he started off. He said, you know, when you approach any kind of a church building, all you have to do is walk through the parking lot and you can tell what kind of a church it is. Now this intrigued me immediately, being, what, 20 years of age. And, and so he said, if you come into the parking lot and it's mostly filled with Cadillacs, you're probably outside of a Catholic church building. He said, if you enter into the parking lot and it's mostly filled with Fords, you're probably outside of a Baptist church building. He said, if you enter into the parking lot and it's mostly filled with Chevrolets, you're probably outside of a Church of Christ church building. And then he said, if you enter into a parking lot and it's mostly filled with Volkswagens, today we would say Yugos, he said, you're outside of a Christian science church building because they only think they have a car. And that's when some things started coming together for me in, in my mind about the theology of Christian science. God speaks to us today through his son, Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, Hebrews 8, verse 5, Hebrews 9, verse 15, Hebrews 10, verses 9 and 10. I want to remind you of that acrostic word that we used yesterday. I assure you that the same acrostic fits as we demonstrated yesterday this group known as Christian Science. This woman-made cult known as Church of Christ Scientist, C, charismatic type of founder and or leader, U, undermining the authority of the Word of God, the letter L, lying prophets and failed prophecies are defended, and the letter T for that teaching that stands diametrically opposed to the Word of God. The pioneer preachers would frequently present lessons and in those lessons, they would be dealing with a particular man-made denomination. 
And one way in which they would so effectively show that a man-made denomination was not the church of the Bible, had nothing to do whatsoever with the church of the Bible, was by demonstrating where those man-made churches departed from the pattern of the New Testament. They would, uh, they would put up the name of a particular denomination. They would talk about the wrong founder, the wrong place of origin, the wrong date, the wrong name, the wrong head, the wrong name, of, uh, the, the wrong source of authority. And they would just demonstrate each point by talking about that particular denomination and then turning to the New Testament and showing exactly what the New Testament taught along that very line. And anyone who was really paying attention and who really wanted to learn could very easily see the church of the New Testament is unique from all the man-made churches, denominations, cults, the interdenominational groups, the cowboy church, whatever. And by the way, being part Cherokee, why is it we have cowboy churches and no Indian churches? Now let's apply that very same test to the Church of Christ scientist, and let's see what happens. Christian scientists have the wrong founder. We understand that Jesus Christ is the founder of his church. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. And God gave unto him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, Ephesians 1, 22, 23. So we understand immediately that Jesus Christ is the only head of his church. Mary Baker Eddy lived from 1821 to 1910. Mary Baker Eddy had been quite enamored with a doctor, quote unquote, Dr. Phineas P. Quimby, an early day faith healer. There can be very little doubt that this man had a profound impact upon Mary Baker Eddy and a lot to do with the establishment of what would eventually come to be the Christian, uh, the Christian Science Church. We can rest assured that the Church of Christ Scientist had the wrong founder in Mary Baker Eddy. Christian scientists had the wrong place. Well over seven centuries before the birth of the Messiah, God's prophet let it be known in clarion tone that the house of the Lord was going to be established in the city of Jerusalem, Isaiah chapter 2, 1 through 4. In Luke chapter 24, the verses 47, repentance and remission, remission of sin should be preached in his name unto all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Beginning from where? The text says very clearly, beginning from Jerusalem. This prophecy had its complete fulfillment in the city of Jerusalem on the notable day of Pentecost. The apostles were endued with power from the Holy Spirit as they preached the first gospel sermon on that day. We have recorded in part a portion of the a sermon that was preached by Peter in Acts chapter 2. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved to God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and with wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. After he comes to the conclusion of that sermon, we are told that those who were present and heard the message that day were pricked in their hearts. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And that's when Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for unto in order to obtain the remission of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children, and to all them that are afar off. Then in verse 41, we learn of how some 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel that day as they put on Jesus Christ in baptism for the remission of their sins. In verse 47, we are told that the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. Now, all of these events took place in the city of Jerusalem, circa A.D. 33, in Jerusalem not the city of Boston, Massachusetts. Now, would you like to hazard a guess 
as to where Mary Baker Eddy established the church that Mrs. Eddy built? The Church of Christ Scientists cannot be the church that we read about in the New Testament because we had the wrong founder and we had the wrong place. Christian scientists had the wrong date. In the book of Daniel chapter 2 beginning at verse 31 and those verses following we are told when the kingdom which is the church would have its beginning. From a very very careful study of those pages and secular history we learn that the church that Christ built is almost 2,000 years of age today. The image in that vision of Nebuchadnezzar foresaw the coming of four world empires, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and finally the Roman Empire. And it's that last empire, the Roman Empire, that would represent those legs of iron and those feet of iron and clay that were mixed together. Remember, in Daniel 2:44, and in the days of those kings, in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Sure enough, it was during the days of those kings, the time of the Roman Empire, the time of the Roman emperors, and we learn that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is is at hand, Matthew 3, 1 and 2, Matthew 10, verse 7, Mark 1, verse 15. Then in Luke chapter 10 and the verses 9, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Jesus said, I will build my church, Matthew 16, verse 18. In Mark chapter 9 and the verses 1, he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there are some here of them that stand by who shall in no wise taste of death, till, adverb of time, till they see the kingdom of God come with power. Notice how the scriptures speak of the kingdom, how they speak of the church before Acts 2 and the day of Pentecost. And every scripture prior to Acts chapter 2 speaks of the coming kingdom, the church of my Lord, as being in the future tense. And then after Acts chapter 2 and the events of that day, things change drastically. That's when Peter stood up and preached in Acts 2 verse 16. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes Joel and then he goes into uh, the preaching that we alluded to just a moment ago. But following the day of Pentecost, the kingdom, the church of my Lord is in full existence. Acts 2.47, Acts 5.11, Acts 8.1, 11.22, 13.1, 14.27. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 14, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Colossians 1, 13, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Therefore, something of very great import had to take place on that notable day of Pentecost all of those centuries ago. I want you to notice that Paul penned in Colossians chapter 1, the verses 13, who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now the only way that you could possibly be translated into the kingdom is if the kingdom is in existence. Now the AD 70 aorist of this day do not know what to do with Colossians 1.13. You see, it takes place before the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. The church is fully established. Paul talks about those who could be translated into the kingdom. So the kingdom had to be in full existence at that time. I've actually challenged a couple of the A.D. 70 heirs to meet me in public debate surrounding Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. They are not interested. The Church of Christ Scientists, which is sometimes referred to as the Mother Church, had their beginning in 1879. Now think about that. That is well over 1,800 years too late to have anything to do with the church that you and I can read about in the pages of our New Testament today. So we had the wrong founder. We had the wrong place. We had the wrong date. 
And Christian scientist is also the wrong name. Remember, Christ stated that he was going to build his church. Matthew 16 and the verses 18. So that would indicate that it was his church. And that it could not and would not belong to anyone else. If David builds a tree house, then we would call that David's tree house. If Dub builds a sailboat, then we would call that Dub's sailboat. And when Dub built that sailboat, he nicknamed it the Ark. <laughs> Since Christ built his church, what should we call it? How should it be identified? Well, perhaps the Apostle Paul can give us some insight in Romans 16, 16, when he says, the churches of Christ salute you or greet you. The churches of Christ, the church belonging to Christ, the church that Christ purchased with his blood. Paul also referred to it as the church of the Lord in Acts 20, verse 28. Another acceptable appellation that is found in the pages of Holy Writ, Church of God, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, 2 Corinthians 1, 1. Now, have we given book, chapter, and verse authority for, uh, for the authority for these biblical designations from the word of the living God? Church of Christ Scientist. Where is the book? Where is the chapter? Where is the verse for the authority for the Appalachian Church of Christ Scientist. You begin reading in Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. You go through Revelation chapter 22. You come to the end of the New Testament. And not one time, not one time do you find that designation for the Church of the New Testament. Therefore, it is not the Church of the New Testament. And by the way, who added the word scientist? That was Mary Baker Eddy, the founder, the head of this Johnny-come-lately cult that is known as Christian Scientist. Now, we had the wrong founder, we had the wrong place, we had the wrong date, we had the wrong name. Christian Scientists also have the wrong head. Mr. Salem Kerbin wrote in his book, and I quote, in 1895, Mary Baker Eddy had adopted the title Mother. Consider the meaning of the word Pope. And think about something that the late great brother Marshall Keeble said many years ago. I was a young teenager. He was in a tent meeting in Lawton, Oklahoma. And I'll never forget this statement that he made. He knew that there were a number of members of the Catholic Church in the assembly that very night. And he said to them, if you have a man over here and you call him your father, but he is not your daddy, and you have a woman over here and you call her mother, but she is not your mama, what does that make you? I mean, you think about that. Now, he, he got some laughter, that's true. But he also got some people to thinking. Now, the Pope basically means Big Papa. Mary Baker Eddy then would be Big Mama. But one cult is no closer to the truth than the other. They're both just as far removed from the truth as the other. Jesus remains the sole head of his church according to Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23, Colossians 1, 18 and 24, Colossians 2 verse 19. Since Christ is a head of the New Testament church, then you have to ask yourself the question, who is the head of the Church of Christ scientist? And you have to give an honest answer to that question. This mother-made denomination still claims today that Mary Baker Eddy is the head of the Church of Christ Scientist. The church is actually governed by Mary Baker Eddy's church manual. In 1895, Mrs. Mary Baker Eddy realized that 
one of the greatest dangers that was facing her newfound cult was its own pastors. And the fact that she had no control over those pastors and what they were teaching and what they would do and so forth. So I want you to notice in eight, uh, what she wrote, and this is recorded in Kerbin's book again, page 54. These are the words of Mary Baker Eddy, quote, In 1895, I ordained the Bible and science and health with key to the scriptures as the pastor on this planet of all the churches of the Christian science denomination, unquote. Did you notice her use of the word ordained? Did you notice also that she claimed to be a pastor? She is not the husband of one wife. She is the wife of several husbands. And then I want you to also notice she's the pastor on the planet. That's planet Earth, folks. Sort of like the, great, the late great planet Earth. You've heard that title. Okay, look at this. Denomination. I'm not putting words into her mouth. That's her word. That's her choice. And I want you to know it was a very mediocre choice. But by her own admission, her church is just another of many man-made denominations. So where do we stand? We had the wrong founder. We had the wrong place. We had the wrong date. We had the wrong name. We had the wrong head. Christian scientists also have the wrong authority. Peter admonishes all Christians, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, yet with meekness and fear, 1 Peter chapter 3 and the verses 15. I wish all of my brethren everywhere today we're willing to abide by this divine command. I think back over the past six years or so and of numerous serious and scriptural questions that have been posed to the preacher and the elders and the faculty that are all aligned with the Memphis School of Preaching. There is no telling how many hundreds and hundreds of questions have been asked in all good faith, in all sincerity, in all desire to know the truth, to understand their stance on Dave Miller and the errors of Dave Miller and the failure of Dave Miller to repent. And how many have received an answer? Peter said, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, yet with meekness and fear. I'm not sure how many of these lectures I have appeared on so far, but I do know that in every one of those lectures we have had an open forum. Questions are asked. Sometimes they are asked from people who are in this assembly. Sometimes they come in over the uh, internet. Sometimes they are mailed in in advance. But questions are asked. Biblical questions that deserve biblical answers. And I have never known of one time, I do not know of one occasion, when a sincere Bible question was put before the open forum in this, in this particular lectureship that was not answered. Why the difference? Why the difference since that Brown Trail fiasco? And I can call it a fiasco because my daughter and her husband were in the building as members of that church the day that fiasco happened. She called me that afternoon. 
She was in tears. She was crying. She said, Daddy, I've never seen Christians behave like those men behave today. Brethren, there's no excuse for that. Brethren in Christ, acting like the people of the world, there is no excuse. Repentance must come forth. The Bible is the only source of divine authority. When you and I begin to be asked about our authority, let's imagine you step out the door today and someone comes up to you and asks, what is the source of your authority for what you do religiously? Your worship, your teaching, your Christian living day by day. What is the source of that authority? The truth of God's word makes us free, John 8, 32. John 17, 17, the word of God is inspired. It gives all that we need, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. The word came from God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Acts 10, 36, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. His word shall stand and abide forever, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, 23 through 25. Now let's imagine a similar scenario where you or I would approach a member of the Church of Christ Scientist Organization. We ask them, what is the source of your authority? Would the answer be similar to the answer that we gave? Not at all. You have to remind yourself, they have two textbooks. It is the Bible plus, the Bible plus science and health with key to the scriptures. You know, when I stop and I think about the Bible plus, and I don't mean to continually refer to the late great brother Marshall Keeble, but he had a very profound impact upon me as a, young, as a very young man. Still had hair and everything. But I remember him pre preaching a lesson. And that lesson was called the Bible Plus. And several times during that lesson, he would hold his Bible high in one hand. And then he had a stack of manuals and creeds and disciplines and catechisms. And he would hold those up one at a time. And he just kept the Bible in this hand and went through about a half dozen of those, if memory serves me correctly. And he would hold up the Bible high, pick up one of those man-made manuals. And he would say, if this manual contains more than this book, it contains way too much. And if it contains less than this book, it does not contain nearly enough. And if it only contains the words that are recorded in this book, we don't need it because here we have the word of God. I don't really know how any man could make that any simpler. I mean, that was understandable to a 12-year-old boy. The Bible plus. The religious authority for the Church of Christ scientists by their own admissions, as we have seen, is the Holy Bible plus. The Holy Bible plus, science and health with key to the scriptures, as written by Mrs. Mary Baker Eddy, plus some assistance from a Dr. Phineas P. Quimby. Now, Mrs. Eddy gave lectures on Quimby's spiritual science healing. After the death of Dr. Quimby, which took place in 1865, she wrote her own textbook called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. This writing was published and copyrighted in 1875. I'll let you do the math for yourself. Her book is strikingly similar to a book authored by Dr. Quimby, Science of Man, page 99 of Jennings' writings. Mr. Walter Martin has compared numerous quotes from Dr. Quimby's Science of Man with the writings of Mrs. Eddy that she did in 1868, in 1869, and in 1870. She also copied from the English reader the fourth edition out of Pittsburgh, 1823, which was written by Lindley Murray. It appeared in very large part in Mrs. Eddy's miscellaneous writings, which appeared in the year of 1895. 
And again, I will ask you to do your own math. As I admitted to Sister Brown yesterday, math was never my strong suit in school. The late beloved brother El Eldred Stevens was once lecturing to us on the doctrine of Catholicism. And again, I remember very clearly how he began that uh, particular lesson. He said, boys, the Holy Roman Catholic Church is not holy, is not Roman, is not Catholic. And then he identified his terms and proved his point. Well, we could do the same thing with Christian scientists. I doubt that the Apostle Paul had this particular religious group in mind when he wrote these words, but if you'll turn to 1 uh, Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and opposition of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Now, a friend of mine, concerning the faith, the gospel of Christ, this religious cult has erred greatly. Has erred greatly. According to the Church of Christ scientist, in addition to the Bible, you must study science and health with key to the scriptures, miscellaneous writings, and manual of the mother church. The cult contends that as you use these uninspired books, most of the writing attributed to Mary Baker Eddy, although she did borrow some of it. Uh, if you read these uninspired books, they say you are then able to unlock and have the proper understanding of the Word of God. Now think about how many cults have been dealt with so far in this series of lectures, and there are a couple more yet to come. And I want you to understand that every one of them, without exception, has some other volume plus the Bible that you're going to have to use. I have enumerated seven of those things that stand diametrically opposed to the word of the living God. And I'm going to have, to, I heard that cough, so I'm going to jump to my final point and bring this lesson to a close. Lazarus, they say, never died. Mary Baker Eddy taught repeatedly that death is only an illusion. The main problem I have with that particular teaching is if Lazarus never died, how are they going to explain the words of Jesus as recorded in John eleven fourteen, 14 where Jesus therefore said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Since she teaches that Lazarus never died, she has also taught that my Lord and my Savior told a lie. And yet we know that Christ was sinless. He did not sin. In Hebrews 9:27, in inasmuch as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Yes, the judgment comes after death, but death comes first. Death comes before. And the more I learn about the strange doctrines of this woman, the more I wonder why one of her many husbands did not have her committed. She said, there is no death. If there is no death, why is it that on December the 3rd of 1910, Mary Baker Eddy had the audacity to up and die. And you can visit her tomb today near Mount Auburn in Boston. She said death is not real. She said death is only an illusion. We are in the 21st century and her illusion continues to this very day. Give me a break. I thank you for the kindness of your time and your attention. Jesse, thank you for that fine lesson. Uh, as to the question, why do Christians or anyone do what they do? 
I, I can't really uh, provide a, an answer to that, but I do know that there will be a day where we all will stand before the uh, judgment bar of God, and all excuses will at that time be dismissed, and we will be judged for the uh, deeds done in the flesh. When I was attending uh, Abilene Christian College, now university, I worked for a CPA firm. It was called Conley Morphew and Company, and Mr. Morphew was a Christian science, scientist, member of the Christian Science Faith. And he did, on occasion, uh, try to, um, I wouldn't say indoctrinate me, but at least introduce me to the uh, concepts of Christian science, and he told me that this was all just an illusion, as you said. <clears throat> Of course, I want to be sure the paycheck was not an illusion because <clears throat> when it came time to pay for my tuition, I, I was sure they, gonna, they were going to want real money, not illusory money. But uh, nevertheless, uh, he did get uh, very sick at one time. But it's all an illusion. Sickness is just an illusion. And uh, he had to consult with Christian science practitioners, and it was a very, it was not a, a serious illness if treated but he, he never treated it. And so he was out for quite some time. <clears throat> and I'm sure that uh, even though it was all illusion, the fact that he was able, not able to bill out as much time as before was not illusion. At least the other partners would uh, have viewed it that way. So I, I think, uh, uh, you know, why people do that, I, I don't know. It's just uh, the imagination of people goes to all ends. And it can result in many, uh, you know, we, we use the word weirdo, <laughs> results in a lot of weirdos. Uh, Jesse has also demonstrated, I think, quite uh, uh, well that if you bring an Oki down to Texas and let, let him associate with the Texas brethren long enough, he will be able to spell mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be dismissed now to the top of the hour and we'll reconvene. <laughs>